Um, welcome again, everyone. My name is Shana Jacques. I am the Outreach Manager for PSS Circle of Care, and we want to welcome the Emilys. I like that. <laughs> um, so today we'll be talking about create, creative activities for caregiver of old, older adult. We have Emily Scholler and Emily Sorensen. Okay, so, and I know some of you might know a little bit about PSS already, but just to recap, we are a nonprofit agency that provides services for older adults, older New Yorker, the family and community to thrive. Our PSS, like, let me, our, I'm sorry, my mom is right here. Um, I'm wondering. Okay, so, yes, our PSS Live University offers educational um, training for uh, online because lately we have been offering all our services online. And also we do have 10 local senior centers that are designed to help older adults to stay healthy, engaged, and connected. The service that I'm working um, under is called PSS of Care. We provide free personalized support for those caring so if someone is feeling chronically ill has a memory loss issues. Um, we do have a building, it's built for grandparents um, raising grandchildren. It's, it is the first in the United States. Um, and our coming of age program, it's for people over 15 plus to live with passion and purpose. Um, just a reminder about the census, we want everybody to um, fill out the census because it's good for the next 10 years that can help with hospital, school, road, transportation. Um, please, it only takes 10 minutes to do, and you can just um, go to the 2020 census.gov and fill out the form. Um, one more information about our services. So if you want to know more about PSS Circle of Care, you can just um, go online at pssscaregiver.org. Coming of age is coming of age of New York, NYC.org. And all our events are posted online at pssusa.org slash event. And also you can see our past webinar, the one that has been recorded and this one today. Um, just, uh, I'm just gonna introduce at the Emily's. <laughs> just keep, keep. Here you go. Um, Emily Scholler, she is the director of My Sense. She received a, ba a bachelor in neuroscience and her colleague, um, Emily Sorensen, she, um, she is a cognitive enrichment specialist and she received her bachelor in therapeutic recreation and management. Welcome again, ladies. And thank you for your cooperation to present that webinar for us today. Thank you for having us. We'll go ahead and pull up our presentation. Give us one second. Oh, Emily, make sure you unmute. <laughs> Good start. Okay. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, PSS, thank you for having us. Emily and I are so excited to be here today. Uh, so today's webinar, we're going to talk about creative activities for caregivers of older adults. Uh, and we're going to do a deep dive into two activities. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll all have the tools and the confidence to engage your elderly loved one in a creative activity uh, and help light up their lives. So uh, like we said before, I'm Emily Schaller, the director of MindSense, which is a cognitive enrichment program and it's a division of HealthSense, a geriatric care management company. Just a little bit more about myself. Um, I'm also a certified dementia connections facilitator. So I'm trained in helping those with memory and cognitive impairment lead lives of purpose and joy. And I also run a support group uh, for adult children of caring for their elderly parent with dementia at Caring Kind. And I'm Emily Sorensen, or the other Emily. I received my Bachelor of Science degree in Therapeutic Recreation and Management from Brigham Young University's Marriott School of Business. I'm also a certified Zumba instructor and developed a chair Zumba program for elderly clients with mobility issues. And I was initially drawn to MindSense because it's all about providing holistic care with the goal of lighting up lives. 
So just to explain a little bit more about where we come from, what MindSense is, simply put, it's a cognitive enrichment program that uses the power of intentional connection to decrease social isolation, re-engage curiosity, and create joyful moments that ultimately lead to improving the quality of life of older adults and their families. We provide tailored one-on-one -on -one visits that used to primarily take place in the home, but now in order to adapt to our new normal, we've had to make a pivot. So since March, we've been doing virtual sessions with our clients via Zoom. Using technology guided by our cognitive enrichment specialists, our clients can stay engaged in a plethora of activities while remaining socially and emotionally connected. Both of the activities that Emily and I are going to present today can be done virtually and in person as we started to phase back into the home. Yeah, exactly. And just to give a little bit more context too, uh, MindSense was started by Anne Sansevero, who was a nurse practitioner who founded her own care management company. And she noticed that a lot of her clients, uh, especially those with dementia, were extremely socially isolated. You know, they weren't engaging with family and friends anymore. They, they weren't even leaving their homes. And the activities that they once loved, they seemed really distant and removed from. So many times she found, and I think, you know, we as well find, a lot of elder, our elderly clients are just sitting in front of the television for hours on end. She also heard the frustrations and the struggles from caregivers as they felt really powerless in how to help their loved one reconnect and re-engage. So that's kind of where MindSense came from to address those issues and to also provide caregivers with comprehensive and holistic resources for engaging clients socially, emotionally, and even physically. So why is it so important to engage our elderly loved ones? Well, as I alluded to before, social isolation and boredom are extremely common among people living with dementia, but also, you know, the older adult population in general. And I think the coronavirus pandemic has really brought this issue to light. And even from our own experiences, you know, we can really understand how loneliness, how not being able to engage with our friends and family and community or have our usual routines that really plays a part in our physical and mental health. So social isolation is in fact as damaging to one's health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That's crazy. So many studies have shown that the impact of social isolation on health and mortality are actually similar to that of high blood pressure, of obesity, and of physical inactivity. So, you know, this boredom and this inactivity, it also can actually worsen aggressive and agitated behaviors. So it's really devastating to both our physical and mental health, and it also impacts our ability to care. Now, one thing we as caregivers can do to reduce social isolation and loneliness is engage our elderly loved ones. Regardless of how old we are, we want to feel like we have purpose and value. And this sense of purpose and value is met by being engaged in meaningful activities. So keeping seniors stimulated and creating a daily routine that involves activities where they can socially connect, participate in something purposeful and have fun has an enormous impact on their quality of life, well-being, and their physical health. Okay, so now that we've kind of introduced ourselves, we'll go ahead and take a look at our agenda for today. As mentioned previously, we will present two different activities, limerick writing and virtual travel. Now we chose these two specifically because both of these activities are client favorites and have led to a lot of positive outcomes. They're also very customizable based on whatever client you have in mind today, which if you are not already thinking of someone, please do so now. We encourage you to have a particular person in mind throughout this presentation so that the takeaways have a greater impact. Think about how your client would receive these activities. What adaptations would you need to make specifically for them? What topics would you cover? What places would you travel to? We'll break down how to write a limerick as well as how to travel virtually, give some real life examples and talk about the benefits of providing activities in general. And then to wrap it up, we'll have time to answer any questions that have come to your mind. And Emily and I are hopeful that there are some specific questions that are a direct result of keeping your client in mind during this presentation. Okay, so let's get started. What is a limerick? So a limerick is a short, silly poem. They're only five lines long and meant to make you laugh. 
The dictionary definition is a humorous, frequently bawdy version of three long and two short lines rhyming A, B, B, A, pop popularized by Edward Lear. And he was an English artist, illustrator, musician, author, and poet, now mostly known for his literary nonsense and poetry in the 19th century. Now, I was introduced to limericks in the 21st century by my mom. She absolutely loves limericks. And growing up, she would gather my five siblings and myself around to have us write hilarious limericks line by line as a cheap, entertaining activity. She would often sit us in a circle and we'd write one line and then pass it to the next person, expanding on the poem until the five lines were written. Then we would read the result of our collective humor and laugh until our sides ache. There's an age gap, actually of 15 years between my oldest and my youngest sibling which helped me realize that limerick writing is not an ageist activity. Both young and old can equally enjoy this short, simple, and humorous form of poetry. So this is how you would write one. Their limericks are typically based on real life observations with a comic twist. They're really quick and easy to write. And I have an example here that I'll go ahead and read. It says, a woman who once heard a mouse ran screaming all over the house. She sent in the rat to dispose. She sent in the cat, excuse me, to dispose of the rat to find it was only her spouse. Okay, so you see here in blue that the first, second, and last line are a little longer. The goal is for them to be anywhere between seven and nine syllables long, and the last word of each of those lines should rhyme. So we have mouse, house, and spouse. Then for the third and fourth rhyme line, those are a little bit shorter. That's about five to seven syllables and they rhyme with each other, cat and rat. Just to clarify, because those ranges kind of overlap, if you choose to have your first lines only be seven syllables, then you'd want to make sure your second and third are close to five syllables long. That way, your whole poem doesn't end up being the same length. So it's pretty simple, but I want to go ahead and introduce you to a client of ours that we did this activity with. His name's Bill. So Bill, was an engineer by trade. He has a deep-rooted love for the opera and museums, but he'd never wrote a line of poetry in his life. However, the man is an intellectual and he has a very quick wit. So I decided to introduce limericks to him. Bill jumped on the opportunity to express his creative humor through limerick writing and loved it so much, he now calls the two of us the Limerick Society and requests limerick writing as his activity of choice almost every time we meet. He even started to write limericks of his own, unprompted by me, and finds a lot of joy in writing and sharing them. So here's an example. But oh, one day, let me give some context. One day I jumped on a Zoom call with Bill, and all he could talk about were these huge mastiffs he saw on his street corner. For those of you not familiar, mastiffs are gigantic dogs that by some miracle are fitting into someone's apartment on the Upper West Side. I asked Bill to write a limerick based on this observation, but to give it a funny surprise ending. And here's what he wrote. It reads, my friend had a mastiff named Fist. He tried to bite me, but missed. He tried once again, but his breath bent the pen. So I gave him a mint and we kissed. I think he did a pretty good job of giving it a surprise ending. I found with Bill that it was really helpful to have a prompt for him. Having him focus on the mastiff helped guide his thoughts and gave him a good head start. Once I tried opening up and saying, Bill, why don't we write a limerick about anything you want? Go ahead, get started. What do you want to write about? And he got lost in the freedom of it. So I found out that healthy constraints really can help foster that creativity. I also found that just like writing poems with my mom, writing line by line made it an easier task. With Bill, I'll write the first line and then ask him to think of words that rhyme to the last word of the line. So if I wrote the line, there once was a girl named Jan, I would prop Bill to think of words like ran, man, fan, etc., and then build that second line around whatever word he picked. The syllables can sometimes be a little tricky too, but like most poems, there's a sing songy tune to it. Like when you're reading, I don't know, when I was reading, I don't know if you noticed, but it's kind of a da 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 And so just like I did by singing and clapping along with it, I'll have Bill do that with me. And then he's able to catch it onto the syllables. And it 
becomes less complicated of a task. So to take limit grading a step further, I actually created a portfolio for, for Bill where he could see all of his limericks with illustrations, like his very own book of Mother Goose nursery rhymes. He loved rereading old favorites and seeing the visuals attached. Bill's caregivers have even told me that he will read his limericks when he's bored and just laugh until he's crying. Having a copy of his limericks also gives him a template, more or less, to go off of when he chooses to write limericks of his own without my help. Bill and I decided that these limericks were way too good for just us to enjoy, so we decided to host a limerick reading. We created a guest list of friends and family members that we thought would en enjoy these poems and that we'd want to show them off to. Uh, we went through the portfolio and picked out our favorites and even made some edits to them to make sure that they were in tip-top shape. We sent out a formal invitation so, and put it on the calendar so we had something to look forward to. And we even discussed a dress code of how we would want to make sure that we were showered and, and shaven and in a button down and, and look presentable to show off our work. And then on the day itself, friends and family were able to join that special Zoom call where Bill was able to experience some socialization and show off his limerick. I bring up socialization because Bill was a bit of a social butterfly before the pandemic. He would gather once a week at his church and chat with people there. He'd walk around his neighborhood all day long and literally talk to anyone that would listen. He was very quick to make friends. But with the, when the city went on lockdown, he wasn't able to interact in his normal way. And so the opportunity for him to gather as a group, even though it was virtually, had Bill glowing. He told stories and asked friends and caught up with his family members and expressed love and gratitude. And best of all, he was overjoyed to share his limerick. It was so sweet to see him feel a sense of pride in presenting his hard work and to watch him reconnect with those loved ones. So it's kind of amazing how something as simple as writing a five line poem, a little silly limerick, can have so many positive health and wellness results. Because helping seniors stay socially connected and connected and cognitively engaged is essential to their quality of life. Limerick writing can be an opportunity for self-expression, for creative language and word practice, as well as a comic relief from the mundane of each day. Self-expression can become particularly important when the majority of questions these seniors are being asked is, has to do with their comfort and pain levels. Is the medication making them drowsy? Is that treatment helping them? How do they feel? You know, all of those kinds of questions. But they have so much more to offer. They have unique thoughts and opinions and creativity just waiting to be unleashed. Limericks are also a great way to help our clients that seem to be starting to lose language and their ability to recall words. Now we can't reverse the, the progression of dementia or memory impairment, but the principle of if you don't use it, you'll lose it applies here. If we are asking our clients to think of rhyming words and topics outside of their daily jargon, the vocabulary won't slip quite as rapidly. Lastly, we all need comic relief in our lives. Now more than ever, 2020 has been tough. So taking the time to be silly and make each other laugh is vital. It also builds rapport because humor has this funny way of breaking down barriers and building mutual respect and trust. Now I hope I've implied this, but I wanna be explicit in saying that writing a limerick isn't always about how the limericks turn out. We haven't published any of Bill's work but the process is so much fun and rewarding for both client and caregiver. Now that we've talked limericks to death, we're gonna move on and Emily Schaller is gonna introduce us to virtual travel. Great, thank you, Emily. And I, I have to say, I have been to a few of Bill's um, limerick readings and it's, it's so much fun and he's so proud of his work. It really does give him that sense of pride that you were talking about. Um, so that, that's a, a great idea to use um, you know, with anyone's loved ones. All right, so next we're gonna do virtual travel. Now virtual travel, it's basically an experience that, you know, transcends time and borders. It allows you and your loved one to explore a new place, a new culture, or revisit past events or experiences. 
it's a really good way to go, you know, beyond the four walls of their home and ease that cabin fever that I am sure we are all feeling. And as the travel guide that we are, we strive to evoke the sights and the smells even, and, you know, really the mindset of traveling without stepping outside. Now, how do we do this? How do we even get started? That seems like an overwhelming and daunting task. Well, first of all, you know, this is a kind of activity that more personalized and tailored to your loved one, the better it is. So it's important we do a little research. Do they have a favorite country or place? Maybe somewhere they've lived for a while or a favorite landmark that they visited. Have they been interested in a particular region or culture? Do they really love art and architecture or are they more about you know, being outside and being in nature? These are really important questions to ask yourself and also the senior as you plan the trip for them. I think it's important to ask them these questions because it not only allows them to feel involved in the decision-making process, which gives them a great sense of autonomy, but it's also a really easy way to get them excited about the activity. So next we utilize the internet. The internet is going to be our best friend with this activity because so many cultural institutions closed down their doors due to the pandemic, many of them went digital. So Google Arts and Culture, you're gonna wanna write this down, Google Arts and Culture. It's a fantastic website that features content from hundreds, maybe even thousands of cultural institutions. You can access any piece of art you can think of, all in high definition, and you can step inside and explore famous landmarks like the Eiffel Tower, to the Taj Mahal, to taking a virtual tour of the Museum of Modern Art. It's truly one of my favorite tools to use, uh, and I really recommend you guys explore it and try it out. Again, Google Arts and Culture. One of the other things you can consider when you're designing your virtual travel is the use of live cameras. And these are super easy to find and there's so many of them and you can just search on YouTube or Google. With live cameras, you know, you can see everything from the depths of the oceans to outer space and basically everything in between. They're a really easy way to make the travel experience feel as authentic as possible. I also like to use Google Maps as well. That's a really great resource for when you want to use a street view. And street view, you know, it can really make you feel like you're walking around in the place. So it's a great touch to any travel. Uh, and I find that whenever you use it, the seniors, they're blown away by it because it's, it's very realistic. And then another idea, you know, bring in some travel videos, magazines, podcasts, or travel blogs. You know, the sky's the limit here. And there's so much travel media out there for the traveler to consume. Exploring online travel is also a great way to uncover some photographs, maybe learn more about the local history or food or even fashion. Um, this can bring up a lot of great personal anecdotes that make the experience really come alive and feel personal. And then when you can, it's great to incorporate things beyond technology. So if you can take a trip down memory lane with family photo albums or give a call to their favorite favorite travel buddy, um, you know, this is a great way to relive some of those memories. By including these tools that really elicit the personal experiences and reminiscing, the seniors can feel like they're heard and they can express themselves. It's a really great opportunity for them to also practice communication skills, like Emily was talking about with limericks, in a way that's really meaningful to them. And finally, I say you always want to get them excited. Make it a theme for the day or you know, invite their family and friends to the trip as well, even if it's over Zoom. So I'm gonna show you guys an example, uh, cause I think that's really the best way to understand how to do it. And I'm gonna take you guys on a quick trip to Egypt. So again, I like to start off using Google Maps because it really puts the experience into context and offers a great visual. And then I automatically always go to Google Arts and Culture. So for Egypt, they offered um, really great stories about the history of hieroglyphics, viewing ancient Egyptian artwork, seeing the pyramids in street view, or even taking a look inside you know, the ancient tombs. Um, 
that there is already so much you can use for your virtual travel. So it's a great starting off point. I would encourage you to pick, you know, one or two of those stories and then do a deep dive and build off from it. So here is um, an example from Google Arts and Culture that you can see. And this is one of their stories called the ABCs of Hieroglyphics. And as you can see, they've really detailed images that provide context and background. So both of you can really feel like an expert. One of the things to consider when um, picking these stories is depending upon the level of cognitive or memory impairment, um, make sure to balance words versus pictures appropriately. So for someone with more severe impairment, pick stories that are more centered on pictures and have really strong visuals. And then you can summarize the words that are there. A story that's really wordy um, it, it won't be as engaging for them. So to really illustrate um, the benefits of virtual travel, um, I want to talk to you about a client of mine called Molly. Now Molly, she had grown up in Paris and she came to the United States when she was a young adult. Uh, and some of her most fond memories are from there. And the place particularly reminds her of her mother. Now due to Molly's worsening dementia, she had become really recluse. She stopped participating in a lot of the activities that she once loved, like painting and gardening, and she became really socially isolated. So I decided to use armchair travel as a way to, one, connect with Molly and try to get her out of her shell and to, you know, bring some joy to her life. So I started off to get Molly really excited about Paris. I printed out a fake um, plane ticket that said we were going to fly to the Charles de Gaulle airport. I also put a baguette in her oven so Molly could smell the delicious bread. Um, and I also played some French music in the background. Again, trying to create that multi-sensory experience. I'd also given Molly um, a beret to wear. Um, she was really into fashion. Uh, and this small gesture not, was, was not just touching to her, but it also reminded her of her mother because her mom would always wear a beret. So we looked at some of her photo albums, reminiscing on happy times um, from when she lived there. And then all of a sudden, you know, you could see the memories flooding back to her. Like the first time um, she went to the opera at the National Opera House in Paris, or she remembered um, the local bakery that she always went to with her mother when she got uh, a good grade in school. So I also got the address um, of where she lived from her son and put that in Google Maps. And using Street View, we got to tour around her neighborhood. Um, and when we ate the baguette together, to make it feel as authentic as possible, I put on a live camera of a French cafe. So it really felt like we were sitting and dining with the people there. Now, Molly was also fluent in French when she lived there. Uh, and even though she was in the moderate stages of dementia, when I played a YouTube video voicing um, basic French phrases, Molly was able to follow along and repeat the phrases back beautifully. So by the end of the video, we were going back and forth speaking very basic French phrases, um, but it made Molly so happy to speak and even hear the French language because it represented such a huge part of her life. So again, to sum up, you know, some of the things that you can use to take it a step further, get them dressed up, utilize some sort of costume, uh, use food and drink, Everyone always loves food, that's always a winner. Pull in some music uh, and language if you can. And then of course, anything personal, like a photo album or a street address if you can find, that always adds a great personal touch. So there are so many benefits to virtual travel. Uh, I think it brings back, you know, really fond memories. It provides a really positive sensory experience and a sense of escape from the day-to-day -day life. Reminiscing about past memories gives seniors a renewed sense of self-worth and it helps them develop positive emotions. Oftentimes when you see them retell a story, you can see their face light up uh, and you can just watch them come alive with emotion and memory. Specifically for Molly, I think it gave her a creative way to explore fond memories um, and a wonderful opportunity to preserve her past self and her past life. Sensory experience are also extremely beneficial. So they evoke memories and feelings of nostalgia, as well as help them feel connected to the world around them. 
And then finally, like Emily was saying with limericks, virtual travel, it's a fantastic way to escape our day-to-day -day lives and again, foster that creativity and imagination. Well, I definitely want to go on that virtual trip to Paris while we still can't travel to Europe. That sounds awesome. Um, okay, so we're going to go through some of our takeaways for today. Um, first and foremost is to engage our elderly loved ones. While these are just two examples, there are hundreds and hundreds of ways to engage your elderly loved one. Like we mentioned in the beginning, it's really important not only for their quality of life, but also for their health and wellness. Um, an important thing to remember when engaging the seniors is to be able to pivot from one thing to another if you notice their attention slipping, because you can't just present an activity and then have them fall asleep. They need to be stimulated and involved. And some clients can read on one topic for an hour, while others would need a new image flashing on their screen every two to three to five minutes. Um, next point is to personalize. Now, personalizing activity to the strengths and interests of your client is really important. It's good to take into account their cognitive abilities. Think how far progressed they are with dementia or any sort of impairment. How would you want to adjust and simplify the activity based on their level? For example, if I was writing limericks with someone who has lost quite a bit of their language already, maybe their only job is to pick the rhyming word at the end and then I'm able to build a limerick around it. But it still leaves them space to have that autonomy, to make their own choices and, and be creative. Um, it's also good to consider strengths of your clients. Um, like with Phil, he wasn't a poet and he, didn't, he, he not once mentioned any sort of draw to writing or poetry or anything as an activity of interest. But he's so smart. He's such an intellectual and has such a quick wit and a very sarcastic humor. And, and so I, I realized that that was a strength of his. And so it, it fit with the activity. It's also good to think about what your client lacks. Do they need more sensory stimulation? Do they need more socialization? Do they need reminiscent therapy, et cetera? All these are good questions to ask yourself before presenting an activity to your client. And We'd encourage you not to be afraid to introduce activities that they've never done before or that maybe their families even told you that they don't like. We had this one client who's a little bit of a thrill seeker. He loves riding his motorcycles. He had a couple Harley Davidsons and he loved skiing and, and anyway, all things thrilling. But now that he's a little further progressed with dementia, he's actually really into baking and arts and crafts, which if you would have asked one of his daughters if he'd be into that, they would they absolutely not but our clients are changing every day and so it's important for us to to allow them to change and, and change with them and um, continue to be creative and and shift and pivot as needed um, and last but not least don't be afraid of technology um, the pandemic made us we don't have a whole lot of a choice but there really is so much out there and it can be very user friendly We've had huge success pivoting our sessions to the virtual world. And whoever said old dogs can't learn, learn new tricks was totally wrong because some of our seniors have been successfully navigating iPads and Zoom calls and whatnot. We had one client who could barely use a landline and now she has her own iPad and will join Zoom links and tune into webinars and play different games on different apps. And, and she loves the freedom that technology has given her, along with our guidance, obviously. Now, these elderly people have teams of doctors and nurses and caregivers and physical therapists and neurologists, the list goes on, all taking care of their health, right? Prescribing medicine and treatments and therapy, all to keep them healthy and, and strong. But we also believe in wellness. They need to go hand in hand. And these activities, this engagement, is a really good way to improve their quality of life because we can't forget that their body also has a mind and a zest for life and we want to help keeping them active and feeling a sense of purpose in order to thrive in their old age yeah couldn't agree more now there are so many like emily was saying so many creative ideas for activities 
that we just gave you two, but also we want to leave you with something a little more than that. So no matter uh, what activity you're engaging your loved one in, these are just some general tips to keep in mind um, that will help you engage them and then also, you know, help you think about what could be meaningful to them as well. So first and foremost, you know, don't baby them. Our goal is to empower them uh, and to avoid a feeling of pity. So don't be afraid of challenges. You know, like as Emily was saying, challenges can be good. Um, you just want to find that balance of challenging them without frustrating them, but then also keeping it fun and light without making it too boring. And to do that, you know, to be able to do that, you really do have to understand uh, their interests and their cognitive abilities. And again, like as Emily was saying, we really want to be flexible in our approach, especially those with dementia. Something they could do yesterday may not be something they could do tomorrow, especially as the disease progresses or as their cognitive impairment worsens, um, changes will repeatedly need to be made in our activity planning based on the, their skills and abilities. But we still want to retain the characteristics of the activities that make it meaningful to them. Also, allow them an opportunity to contribute. So many times seniors have everything done for them, right? So don't be afraid to get them involved in the decision-making process or have them help out. So as a quick example um, for giving seniors the opportunity to contribute based on their strengths, um, you know, as the dementia progresses, seniors can often have something called decision paralysis. And this occurs when they're given too many decisions and they're unable to choose one. So to adapt, but still allow them to contribute, maybe you only offer them two choices. This is a very, very simple way we can be flexible and match our approach to their activities. Also, you wanna really get to know your client. We know what's their personal background or their client or your loved one, but what's their personal background? What's their work history? What are their leisure interests, their social preferences, even their personal care habits and routines? You know, these are all things that are vital in determining what sorts of activities will help them um, you know, contribute to who they have always been. So understanding this information can help you make more informed decisions about what kinds of activities they will like and also how to introduce new activities. And then it's not about the end result. Uh, that's not what you wanna focus on. It's, it's really truly about the journey. Nobody's perfect. Uh, and the focus of the activity shouldn't be to follow everything that you planned accordingly or every step perfectly. There have been countless times where I have planned an activity out for so long and we just end up going in a completely different direction than what I intended. Uh, but that's okay. You know, we can create and make a plan and organize till the end of time, um, but you need to be able to expect that things will change. And if your plan isn't working, you can't force it either. Having alternatives is really necessary and it's very, very helpful. So, you know, create plan A, but also have plan B and C and maybe even D ready. Learning to embrace that kind of change is really how we're gonna support our loved ones. And then finally, we want to establish a routine. And this is really, really important. And activities play a very large role in this. Um, but because there are so many kinds of activities and so many hours of the day, this can seem really overwhelming and daunting. Um, but it's not, and here's why. So there's actually four kinds of activities, and this is something thought out by Tifa Snow, um, who is an occupational therapist, and she's really, really wonderful um, in understanding dementia. I would highly recommend looking her up. But so Tifa Snow says that there's four kinds of activities you can basically uh, incorporate into a routine. Now we've given you two activities today, uh, limericks and virtual travel, and these would be considered leisure activities or activities that are commonly seen as like the most fun part of your day or something you, you want to do, you want to engage in. But when also, when creating a routine with activities, it's important to include the other kinds. So one kind of activity is work. This kind makes us feel valued and appreciated for our skills and our abilities like something like folding laundry. And most people wouldn't consider this fun. However, it's an essential part of our day because it makes us feel accomplished. So involving your loved one in this kind of activity is extremely important 
or their sense of purpose and value. Another kind of activity would be self-care. So things we do to keep our bodies functioning and clean, like brushing our teeth or showering, for example. Now with self-care activities, when you're implementing these into, the daily, into your daily routine, try not to impose this on the senior and do it for them. Um, just so you know, you can get to the next part of your day. Uh, Cause this can actually often create more problems than it can solve. So think of this as an activity. How can you support the senior in accomplishing this task and making it purposeful and maybe even enjoyable? And then finally, the last kind of activity would be restful activities. So this is what we need in order to relax and then later feel in, uh, re-energized because we can't be constantly stimulated all day. That just, that sounds very overwhelming. We all need a break. So, you know, to sum up as caregivers, we should try to incorporate all these kinds of activities into our daily routines, the leisure, the self-care, the work, um, and the rest and develop daily routines um, and activities that are interesting, that are meaningful, and that are doable for our loved one. So limit writing and virtual travel, like I said, are great activities to spark joy. Um, but you can also think about other ways to creatively engage your loved one to fill their day. And again, don't forget about the work, the self-care, and the rest activities as well. So that is all we have for you today. Uh, and if you have any questions about limericks, virtual travel, other activities, how to engage your loved one, you know, we'd be more than happy to answer them. I think you can put it in the chat or you can put it in the question and answer box or you can unmute yourself. Lots of ways. Thank you, lady. Yes, if anybody has any question, please um, direct your question. Sorry, your question to the Q&A box or the chat box. It was very interesting, a lot of information. Mm -hmm. I think each of the um, practice can be helpful for any type of group that some, someone wants to do with mm -hmm. their loved one or whatever. If you, have, if you work in an, another agency with helping an older adult, I think you can also practice this. Yeah. Um, yeah, they were, they really, they're really good. Um, let's see. Um, again, if you want to just say something, you can let me know. Just use the ways and I can allow you to say something. Oh, no. Do you guys want to put your, um, do you want to put your information? Um, if anybody has any question, they want to reach out to you. Yeah, uh, we can put it in the chat. Is that the best way to do it? Yeah, please feel free to reach out to either Emily or I. I know. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, she <laughs> said that um, it was very informative. And thank uh -huh. you for sharing. You are very welcome. I know being a caregiver right now, it's it's never an easy thing to do, but now especially during the pandemic, it's even more difficult. So I do give you guys all so much credit um, because you are doing really, truly amazing work. I'm just writing our website also in the chat box for people that have any other questions or inquiries. Thanks, Kimberly, for joining us today. <laughs> she said we were excellent. How sweet. <laughs> so if you guys don't have any question, we'll just log off. Again, thank you, ladies. That was really interesting and informative and very good information for our caregivers. Um, any of you that wants to review the presentation today will be posted on our website in a few days. Just check out pssusa.org slash events and they will be there. Um, my name again is Shayna Jacques. So if you have any question regarding, um, are we going to get the information in the chat before you end the meeting? Um, which information I'm pretty sure knowing, can you mention which information that you're looking for? Or oh, the presenters, oh, I think they added 
They added in the, in the chat. Yeah, we have both of our emails listed. And then, um, Emily, do you want to put the phone numbers that we have people call? Yeah. Perfect. And then our website's linked there as well. It's healthsense.org slash mindsense. Yeah, better feel free to contact us that way. Can you can you see the what we're putting in the chat? I hope so. I can see it. I'm not sure if oh okay, one second. It's just because it's on all it's for it's on it was only for me and you guys. So let me just change it. Okay, that's why. Perfect. Yes, yeah, you couldn't see it, Noreen. I'm I just Sorry. fixed it. I'm not sure. Can you tell me if you can see it now? Let me know. Okay, some, someone asked, do you have any printable activities on your website? Um, we don't have on our website. However, if you do shoot us um, an email, um, we can definitely give you guys some other resources that include websites with other activities or just activity ideas in general. Um, so our emails are there. So you can just say, hey, we went to your presentation today. What are some resources you have? And we will email those to you personally. And Emily and I both are, are cognitive enrichment specialists. And so it's our, it's our job to present our clients with activities. So if you had a client that would be interested in these kinds of activities, but you didn't necessarily feel like you wanted to go through the effort to put on an activity for them, feel free to reach out to us and we'd be more than happy to help you out. That was a good question. Yes. So, okay. So what we'll do, um, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was only two old panels. I just fixed it. Oh, you still can't see. Okay. So you can just add it again now because now it's for the attendees too. Okay. Thank you, Emily. Yes. And then the phone number is 646-241-3463. And our website is www.health.org. Okay, and feel free to follow us on Instagram also if you have it. Mindsense underscore NYC. We do have a lot of activity ideas actually on our Instagram as well. But again, you can email us as well. Okay, hopefully that and works. And also, if anybody is missing anything, you can just email me. Um, the email that came to you with the registration, you can email back to that. Okay, yes, so we'll leave it. We'll leave it on. Yes. Um, if you're missing anything, and you can just reach out to me, I can just send forward it to you. Um, but yeah. Thank, thank you again. so much, guys. Yeah, thank you for yeah, having we're us. We're just gonna leave it a few more minutes, just for everybody to write the information. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Um, if great. anything, I will send you all the information, okay? Okay. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yeah.